Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. You're watching Alaska Weather with us on this Saturday, August 10th, 2019. Thanks for watching, and as always, you can get this information in an updated form anytime you want for your part of Alaska by calling the Alaska Weather Information Line 1-800-472-0391. Find us online at weather.gov slash Alaska. We'll have links to our social media accounts as well as the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center, the National Tsunami Warning Center, uh, the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit, and a whole lot more. Of course, your local forecast is just a click away. And when you have questions, comments, or concerns about what you're seeing here on the show or about any of our services provided from the National Weather Service here in Alaska, feel free to let me know. I'm happy to serve you any way I can and certainly to answer your questions and get you pointed in the right direction. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is how you find me. Let's take a look at drought conditions across southeast. Of course, not a whole lot of change in the last several weeks or even months there. For southern parts of southeast, we're still looking at D3, extreme drought, a very dry condition south of Petersburg to Ketchikan, Heidelberg, and wrapping up the southern inside passage through the Dixon entrance there. Up north, you can see a little bit less intense orange color. It goes all the way to Haines, Skagway, out toward Gustavus, Juneau, Sitka, and south toward Pre Petersburg and up toward Hyder. Uh, that is still an impressive level of drought, an ongoing drought for southeast, but you'll see in the last month or so, this has expanded into southwestern Alaska and into the Yukon Flats, south to Fairbanks, Nanana, Tanana, Bettles, and up toward Arctic Village. And this puts us in abnormally dry conditions for many locations, but south of Palmer to the Kenai Peninsula. We're still talking about D1, moderate drought there, so dry conditions in a lot of places where a lot of folks in Alaska live. And this is also a problem for our wildfire conditions there, as that continues to go on into late summer, something we usually don't see. By this time of the year, things are usually quieting down. And they have been for the north, uh, but they're still very dry and uh, dangerous across some parts of south central, and uh, even at certain days across southeast, which is pretty unusual. As we look at the 48-hour flood potential up north, uh, passing weather system will drop some uh, localized heavy rainfall across some areas uh, in the Beaufort Sea coast and the North Slope. Because of that, uh, some streams may see some quick rises there in some high water, uh, certainly looking for that potential around Fairbanks and south, and also because of the glacial dam release outside of the northern Gulf waters there east of Cordova. None of these are producing any flash flood watches or warnings at this point, uh, but this is kind of the lowest tier of awareness that we have for you. I want to say that uh, there certainly could be some localized rises there if you're out and about, certainly on the canoe or on the kayak. Across northern parts of southeast, the Copper River Valley, the Sitna and Matanuska Valley, and down toward the western Kenai, including Anchorage, and also around parts of Bristol Bay, high fire danger continues today. And with not a whole lot on the satellite picture to show, there probably isn't going to be any much uh, relief across south central Copper River Valley or southwest. For southeast, you'll notice that we have low pressure sitting just to your south right now, but that is actually pulling in moisture away from the coastline, drying things up across southeast. Up north, a new disturbance working its way across the Beaufort here is going to bring in some rainfall across the Beaufort seacoast tonight and tomorrow, probably an opportunity for that, but also bringing with it the threat for some coastal erosion around the Beaufort uh, through the next 36 to 48 hours. So we may see some surf that's upwards of uh, three to five feet offshore, and that could cause some minor coastal erosion. Probably a good bet to pull things back from the beach if you're on the Beaufort seacoast, uh, just to protect from that possibility. Low pressure around uh, the western Aleutians is pushing a frontal boundary across a large chunk of the Bering Sea. You can see that quickly spreading out. Uh, the most active area is well north of St. Paul and northwest of St. Matthew. Uh, this is slowly working its way eastward. Not going to see a huge uh, movement into the west coast before we get into Monday or Tuesday, I think, but you will see a, a decent amount of moisture gathering along that front. And so once again, for areas along the northwest coast, we're going to need to keep watch for some heavier rainfall perhaps developing across the region as this is a generally slow moving, slow moving system with a pretty good track for bringing in that southwesterly warm and wet air over the Pacific. Most other places are Fairly calm this afternoon. You'll notice uh, generally nice weather across south central and southwest, albeit warm and dry. 
Uh, low pressure across the western bearing, sitting at 993 millibars. Out ahead of that, some areas of rain for Adak and Adka, St. Paul, St. George. High pressure is sitting at around uh, 1,016 millibars for the Gulf, with a weak area of low pressure sitting across southeast. Again, this is drawing that air into kind of a drying formation across southeast. Cooler air is already spread southward, up north uh, periods of rain, drizzle, and fog for the Beaufort Sea Coast. Uh, the actual boundary itself will continue sliding eastward tonight and probably start to fall apart a little bit more. Out ahead of that, though, remember we were talking about the potential for some localized heavy rainfall that could bring up streams and creeks around the Fairbanks and Nanana area, and this is what we're talking about here. Not a lot of rain, but enough to maybe get your attention. So just be mindful of what's going on upstream if you're out and about. Out to the west, the low pressure system drops a notch to 992 millibars, pushing a front into the Gulf of Anadir and across the central chain. High pressure is going to hold that back initially across the west coast, 1,023 millibars there, a little bit stronger up across the Chukchi coast. This may create some fog for our friends around Wainwright, out toward Point Hope and Point Lay, and south into the Seward Peninsula. You'll see maybe some areas of light rain or drizzle as those two waves kind of pass each other in the night. As we get into Sunday, uh, the first wave is moving eastward and that cooler rush of air with showers will gradually peel out of the interior as we go through your Sunday. Out west, the initial wave is going to fall apart. It looks like that'll kind of weaken some more areas of showers, light rain and drizzle around the Bering Strait communities down into the Yukon Delta. For southeast, a couple showers rolling around there, an upper level wave, not terribly strong, is passing over generally from east to west and trying to pull that out to sea. The bulk of southeast is going to stay dry. You may see some clouds and maybe some breezier conditions. Right now it doesn't look like that's going to get up into a, a dangerous level for fire concerns at this point, but uh, folks in the forecast office there in Juneau are keeping very close watch on that. High pressure sitting south of Sand Point, 1,024 millibars there. Could lock in a little bit of fog on Sunday just outside of Hitchinbrook entrance and for the northern Gulf. Places like Kodiak Island, uh, anywhere from Kenai down toward Homer, and really most of South Central and the Susitna Valley look like a beautiful day for you. Dry, warm, unusually so, but dry if you're looking for that. As you look out to the west, the next little push of this weather disturbance coming across the bearing will seal up that front a little bit more again, and that could bring some more rain into Constantview Sound, Seward Peninsula all the way down toward Norton Sound and Unalakleet. Uh, back toward the YK Delta, and then another surge of low pressure here. This is what's got my attention for rainfall. Uh, this could be a kind of a moisture gathering system and bringing that southwesterly motion into west and southwestern Alaska and eventually northwestern Alaska, bringing that moisture up a little bit better along the front. So Monday and Tuesday, we need to keep watch out for some more of that heavier rainfall. Maybe not as much as what you saw in Nome the other day, but certainly uh, more rain on top of that. Areas of light rain and drizzle across the north slope and then showers across southern parts of southeast with high pressure holding over the Gulf for Monday. What about temps? As we get into Sunday morning, 50s for southeast, south central, lower to mid 50s, Kodiak warm at 56, same goes for Bethel in the mid 50s, 51 for Gamble and Subunga, about 50 in Nome, and 37 for Utkiavik, a little bit milder there around Kaktovik with 40s and 50s around the middle Tanana Valley. Back into the upper 60s for Sunday, lower 40s for most of the North Slope, even with that front passing through, still not really that cold, 60 around Nome. Uh, Bristol Bay temps, Dillingham, King Salmon in the 60s and 70s, Sandpoint 66, Dutch Harbor looking at 59, and Southeast looking at temps in the 60s and even 70s for Haines, Skagway, Juneau, and Gustavus. Yakutat down to 51 Monday morning. Uh, most areas in Southeast in the mid 50s, South Central and Prince William Sound in the lower to mid 50s for you. King Salmon looking at temps just shy of 60 in the morning on Monday, 54 for Unalakleet, lower 40s. For most of the North Slope, it uh, looks like Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse could dip into the 30s. And Adak and Atka right around 50 degrees, warming to nearly 60 by Monday afternoon, almost 70 in Fairbanks. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And here's a look at your flying weather now. IFR conditions will stretch across the Beaufort Sea coast and through the Bering Strait. Most of the Aleutians will be covered up with IFR in the morning. Uh, including St. Paul and St. George, and many of our western capes there. IFR is going to spread into southern parts of southeast. Marginal conditions lingering across the north and western Gulf Coast, but most of south central and really most of the interior should start out tomorrow with VFR conditions. Now, some areas along that rainfall that we were just talking about, that could be heavy in a few places for the interior, might start off with MVFR in the morning. As we get through the afternoon, that should improve as that rainfall moves eastward. Watch for marginal conditions in the north. IFR conditions for the Chukchi Coast linger in the afternoon. And from St. Lawrence all the way down to St. Paul, St. George, and really most of the Aleutians, again, still sticking with IFR through the afternoon. But the interior flying looks great. No big surge of 
icing or turbulence or poor visibility in any great capacity there. It looks like everything along the Yukon Valley, uh, the Koyukuk Valley southwest of Lake Iliamna, all the way through the Alaska Range passes, Kenai, and all the way into southeast looks really good there. You may see MVFR kind of sneaking into some of the bays and passes and certainly around Prince William Sound for Sunday afternoon. IFR stays south of Kodiak Island, but you may see marginal conditions over most of the island for most of your day. For Monday morning, IFR lingers across the north slope again, Utkiavik to Wainwright and then eastward toward Kaktovik, Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse, south of your passes, VFR all the way through Monday morning for the Alaska Range southwest and most of the Koyukuk Valley. You'll notice that MVFR gets into Anaktuvik and Attigan Pass, at least the northern extents there. For southern parts of southeast, certainly the southern half, IFR conditions should be expected south of Kodiak Island and once again most of the Bering Sea and even parts of the west coast by the afternoon. That rainfall is going to bring visibility and ceilings down across the west for Kotzebue Sound, Norton Sound into parts of your southwestern capes, Macquarie for sure. Out across the central and western chain, IFR continues there. IFR for most of the Gulf, but VFR for most of our villages in southeast, including Haines, Skagway, Juneau, all the way into the Kenai. But watch for marginal conditions sneaking up into Homer, maybe just south of um, uh, Kenai. And it looks like most areas around south central, the Alaska Range passes, and again, most of the interior should be showing VFR most of your Monday afternoon. Here's your pass conditions in detail now for your Sunday. Anaktuvik and Attigan Pass, they look pretty good. We're going to call VFR all day long there. Same goes for Lake Clark and Merrill Pass. Rainy Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions leaning over to VFR. Windy Pass, looks like marginal conditions with some improvement throughout your day and really expecting the same around Isabel Pass and onward into Mentasta Pass where it probably stays VFR really most of your Sunday. Tanita Pass, looks like VFR most of the day. Portage Pass looks pretty good. Now, marginal conditions maybe in the morning, but that should peel out of the eastern side a little bit, improving to VFR. And Chilkoot and White Pass, we expect to see VFR uh, rules there all day long. Freezing levels show that cooler air trying to make inroads into northern parts of Alaska. It's really going to slow down. Two to 6,000 foot levels there generally along and north of the Brooks Range summits. Then we get back into that mild air for most of central, west, southern, and southeastern parts of Alaska, anywhere from 8 to 10,000 feet. Uh, even the Alaska Peninsula there is looking at levels at 12 to 14,000 feet out toward the Aleutian. So a lot of warm air there. And icing potential is limited. It's present, but pretty limited across the eastern Brooks Range there. That's going to be above about 8,000 feet. Watch for isolated moderate across some of the northeastern quadrants of Alaska, but really no major uh, issue with most places in Alaska at this point. Uh, jet stream's doing that thing where it's going to keep us pretty warm. We've got that surge of cool air working in from the north right now, and that's where that rain's coming from up north. Clouds in the frontal boundary that's pushing down at the surface slowly and surely into the interior. But this is on a northwest to southeast trajectory, so it's taking a lot of that cold air and really bypassing most of Alaska with it. But I expect to see this changing up a little bit more to where more parts of Alaska are going to get into this trajectory as we get into the week. In the meantime, low pressure out across the western bearing is helping to drive this high pressure ridge further and further north across western Alaska. That's going to keep us warm until this moves a little bit more to the east and to the south, allowing some of that cool weather to work back in. Now, as we look at your 9,000 foot level winds, here's high pressure holding on uh, to the west coast, anywhere from west and southwesterlies across the west coast, 20 to 40 knots. Low pressure is weak, but drawing in drier air across southeast and north and westerlies coming across the north slope up to 30 knots or so across most of your North Slope communities. 3,000 feet, here's our high pressure ridge once again. Uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 knots coming up the west coast. Our west and southwesterly winds over the bearing, pushing that ridge further northward and low pressure dragging in northwesterlies across the central and northern interior. 10 to 20, low pressures in the same spot in southeast and very limited turbulence potential. <laughs> Technology. It's the rhythm of our everyday life. We're more dependent on satellite and communication systems than at any other time in history. Disruptions can affect our economy and even our safety. To prepare for the effects of such events and minimize impacts, we need to look outside our atmosphere, some 93 million miles away, at a star we call the Sun. It's our main energy source. 
It warms the earth and grows our food. While the sun and the space between may seem pleasant from our perspective, it's anything but peaceful. At its surface exists a chaotic state of eruptions and radiation. And unlike Vegas, what happens at the sun doesn't stay at the sun. Space weather is essentially emissions from the sun, uh, radiation, magnetic field that erupts from the solar surface, pumped out into space, sometimes right towards Earth. When it impacts the Earth, it impacts our technology. That's what we call space weather. These solar events and their effects at Earth can disrupt systems we take for granted. From causing blackouts to the power grid, to delaying offshore drilling operations due to inaccurate GPS data. Interference with communication systems can force air traffic to reroute and impact rescue response and coordination. Outside our atmosphere, solar radiation can harm astronauts and the systems they depend on. The good news is that these eruptions can be detected early. Forecasters at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado, have their eyes on the sun at all times. The Space Weather Prediction Center is part of the National Weather Service and is very much like a normal weather forecast office. We're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're looking at data, we're looking at imagery, we're looking at model outputs. As conditions develop, we put out alerts, warnings, and watches of imminent activity to our customers so they can take action. In many ways, forecasting space weather is a lot like forecasting hurricanes. Those who rely on space weather forecasts, like electric power grid managers, are informed early on and can begin taking protective action. When we see an eruption on the sun, space weather forecasters will issue a watch. And this is much like a hurricane watch. When a hurricane sits offshore of Miami, for example, perhaps 48 hours out, we too can see way in advance that something may be coming towards the Earth. As the storm moves toward us, it hits a monitoring spacecraft orbiting a million miles away from Earth. It's kind of our, our buoy sitting out there offshore and that hurricane about 30, 45 minutes before it makes landfall, we'll get the measurements from the buoy. That's what the spacecraft does for us. That big eruption that left the sun hits the spacecraft. Now we've got the measurements of exactly what's going to impact us here on Earth. And we issue the warnings to give the power grid a heads up that the storm is now imminent. An interesting element to this whole process is that when the forecasters issue the alert, the power grid receives the alert, takes the necessary actions to protect the grid, the average citizen never knows anything ever happened. The number of customers who rely on space weather information continues to grow. As our reliance on technology increases, so will our need for constant monitoring of the sun. Space weather affects technologies. As conditions develop, we put out alerts, warnings, and watches to our customers so they can take action. GPS has changed society. Most people don't realize how remarkable and how many different applications there are. The GPS has become an integral part, not just of our daily lives as far as cell phones and guidance for our cars and mapping, but the whole uh, system in agriculture is really relying heavily on high accuracy GPS. So they're using GPS to plant those seeds 
at centimeter accuracy. And then they can come behind it and, and irrigate and fertilize right where that seed is with that one centimeter accuracy. The GPS creates a line for the operator that he can steer along. Or you go to another level and the operator doesn't steer anymore and the tractor has an automatic steering system on it, much like a cruise control on a car, except for when I push the button, it doesn't drive a set speed. When I push a button, it stays on a predefined line. You don't even need lights. You can do it at nighttime. You program your GPS and it's driving that tractor for you. So it's, uh, it's huge and it's changing the way that the farmers farm the fields. Six or seven days out. There's an interest in GPS applications from space weather side because when the sun is eruptive, it causes GPS to falter and in some cases it doesn't work at all. Productivity may suffer to a certain degree in that there's no way that I as a human being can steer as good eight hours a day as a, a GPS system is going to do. It's going to be the same all day long. Some of the other application technologies those are going to be gone. We're not going to have the ability to do good section control on sprayers and planters and fertilizer applicators without GPS. We see a huge growing customer base in so many different industries, so many different sectors now relying on GPS and high precision GPS. They're all big customers for us. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Another update on your sea ice edge. Uh, not a whole lot to update you about. Uh, the northern edge, or the southern edge of this, I should say, is uh, considerably well offshore. The North Slope community is there, uh, anywhere from about 120 uh, nautical miles to the north and east of Kaktovik to over 200 miles north and northwest of Utkavik and Wainwright. So uh, continue to melt things back, and again, it's only August the 10th. For the latest sea ice information anytime, including the next season's outlook, head to weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice for the Alaska Sea Ice Program's information. Sunday's forecast in southeast looks like light winds and small seas in every community there. On the inside, it's been a little bit blustery today, and fire weather concerns are something to be mindful of there. It does not look like we're going to get into a very windy situation as we were just a few days ago. However, uh, if the winds come up in a very localized area, uh, the fire danger will skyrocket in that localized area because conditions are still so dry. Look for winds around 5 to 10 knots on the inside and outside with small seas, 2 to 3 feet tops on Sunday. On Monday, a little bit more of a northwesterly push coming down the outer coast around 10 knots. Looking for 3 to 4 foot seas there and 2 to 3 foot seas on the inside. Southerlies up to 15 knots in the Lynn can Canal and northwesterlies around the Clarence Strait. Again, 3 foot seas expected there on Monday. In Prince William Sound, the northwestern Gulf Coast, and all the way up Cook Inlet. It looks like we'll see generally light winds, 10 to 15 knots. You might get a little bit of a stronger westerly push coming across the Barrens and pushing into Kamishak Bay. Anywhere from three to six foot seas there around the Barrens. Easterlies, very light inside and outside of Prince William Sound. Small seas and light winds there. And really not much of a change on Monday around the region. Resurrection Bay all the way into the Barren Islands. You're looking at about 10 to 15 knots. A light wind coming up Cook Inlet, anywhere from 10 to uh, maybe 15 knots. Generally, three-foot seas in Cook Inlet as we head into Monday. For Bristol Bay, light winds, small seas for you. Southerly winds north of Cold Bay and Falls Pass, 20 knots there and three-foot seas. Westerlies blowing into the Gulf from the Alaska Peninsula coastline and over Shelikoff Strait and through Kodiak Island, about 10 to 15 knots. Looking for three to four-foot seas there on Sunday. Not much of a change on Monday. A little bit more of a southwesterly push for all locations, 15 to 20 knots. Expecting four to five foot seas in the region and as much as three to five foot seas down the Alaska Peninsula coastline, 15 to 20 there on Monday. For the Aleutians, southerly winds coming up along a frontal boundary, working in slowly from the west to the east. You can see some of the faster winds out ahead of it, 25 to 30 knots there, looking at southerlies in all regions, about six to 10 foot seas, the highest of which will be on the Pacific side. 
Out across the west, winds are bending into low pressure here, 20 to 25 knots, 8 to 9 foot seas on Sunday. That should settle down a little bit on Monday, but we'll keep some of those faster winds moving along that slow moving front, still looking at about 25 to 30 knots around Adak, Adka, toward Nikolsky, and maybe just south of Unalaska, anywhere from 8 to about 11 foot seas there on your Monday. For the west coast, south and southeasterly winds continue generally south of St. Lawrence Island, 20 to 25 knots in the region with 7 to 8 foot seas. Closer to the coast, those seas really fall off. Look at 2 foot seas there in Norton Sound and 4 foot seas in the Kuskokwim Delta region all the way through Etil and Strait before it starts to pick up again. As we get into Monday, the winds will shift a little bit more to the south and west from the Kuskokwim Delta, Etil and Strait all the way into Norton Sound. You're still looking at a south and southwesterly flow, but it has just a little bit more of that southwesterly direction in it there. So Hooper Bay, Macquarie, you'll probably notice that change. Looking for about five to seven foot seas across the west coast on Monday. For the North Slope, a north and westerly flow will continue once again. This is the winds that we're talking about that could chew up the coastline just a little bit. Some minor coastal erosion is possible in this area. And as we we're saying, it'd be a great idea to pull your stuff off the coast just a little bit there. If you can, bring it in before uh, you lose a little chunk of the beach there with that. Again, minor coastal erosion possible with these winds that should improve as we head into Monday. Now on the Chukchi coast, not looking for that strong of a wind. 10 to 15 knots and 2 to 4 foot seas there on Sunday. By Monday, not much change in the west. You can see some improvement here across the Beaufort Sea with west and southwesterly winds at 15 knots. 3 to 4 foot seas expected there tops for your Monday. Recapping tonight's weather, the wind will continue to blow in across the Beaufort Sea coast tonight and again tomorrow. That should improve as we head into Monday. Out in the west, low pressure sends a front across the Bering Sea, heading toward St. Lawrence Island and Macquarie, all the way out toward the central Aleutians. The frontal position around the central Aleutians won't change very much for Sunday, and that'll keep moisture and wind concentrated in this region here as that warm and wet air is sent northward. Also looking for showers across southern parts of southeast, just about everywhere else in Alaska and south central, southwest, and northern parts of southeast will stay dry and very mild. Monday's weather looks a little unsettled across the west. Periods of heavier precipitation, rainfall may be possible across the west, and we'll be watching for another return of what we saw earlier last week with low pressure in the Gulf. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.